Troisor, hello, welcome to the latest episode of Rob Ryan Red, brought to you in association with Red 10 People Development. On today's show, we'll take a look back at back-to-back home wins in two different competitions. We will answer a few of your questions, um, mainly following on from Ryan Barnett's exceptional display at the weekend. What was the best individual performance that you have ever seen? And, well, I'm sure we'll find some other things to look forward to. Of course, Wrexham don't play this weekend, but there's going to still be a bumper pack show. Uh, all that and more coming up. So, Naif, I suppose the most pressing place to start, do I have to ask how you're doing? Do we do the niceties still or...? It's up to you. you can do. I'm doing. I'm doing fine. Uh, I, do I look refreshed? I mean, usually I feel like you'd be worried and you're checking I'm all right, but I must look well uh, because I'm doing very, very fine. Made it back to the race course uh, for the Northampton game, so yeah, full of um, full of joy, mate. Do you want to start with Northampton or do you want to start with Wolves? Again, it's one of those sort of double headers where there was eleven changes between the two, so they are very different. They both deserve their own sort of analysis don't they? I guess we'll start at Northampton at the weekend. And it's very hard to almost remember that we went into that game quite pessimistic. And there were, you know, people saying the wheels have come off, Parky out. Okay, maybe they weren't being serious. But (laughs) Northampton at home had the potential to be a banana skin because we'd gone to away games without uh, victory. The point at Leighton Orient, the defeat at Stevenage. But we did what we always do, Nath. We made a good League One team look like an average one. And we did it at Fortress Kairas, and there were some exceptional individual performances. Yeah, I think I actually think Northampton are a pretty average um, League One team. And I think if you've got any ambition of doing something in the division, and I know that doesn't sound very respectful, I do mean it with you know, say with all due respect, but it, it then they're not they're not going to be up there. I know listening back to the Northampton podcast, it was kind of cautiously optimistic hopeful more than anything i i can't see them doing much i thought tyler roberts was okay he looked like he was on a one-man crusade to try and score past arthur conco and never looked likely I, what struck me most about that game there are a few different talking points lewis brun and uh Bobsy barney was amazing but really what i came away from that performance was the the some of the beautiful football that we played you know we knocked it around with purpose with speed and if anything it it, it made it Slightly jarring that when we go away from home, we we can't seem to replicate this same level of verve and, and tenacity and and flair because you know you see that the little pockets people get into the I know they get called the backstick boys, don't they? In terms of McLean's at the backstick, if Barney's there and Barney vice versa. But I thought some of the positions that Dobson took up, some of the positions that um, Elliot Lee took up, and my mum, it's first game she's done the season, she hasn't been too well, so. She made it and she came away and said George Dobson, she thought was absolutely brilliant. And I know a lot of people have been saying that for weeks, but you know, get the George uh, for, Dobson for calendar. Yeah, the oh God. The, well, she, she initially she was saying, who's the one with the really, 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 really gelled back slick hair? I was like, oh, okay, I don't know how much gel he's got, but it's, that's George Dobson. Um, but for me, I, I guess one of the main talking points before we got onto Barney, because he was obviously the, the showstopper, the headline, I actually thought. And I know this leads into the Wolves bit as well, but I thought Lewis Brunt had a really, really impressive cameo. I thought he made an impact where maybe he didn't uh, in in the Salford game. So while it wasn't a, a headline really from that first game, I know he stood out in the second game, maybe get onto him shortly. But yeah, Lewis Brunt, one of the standouts. But obviously, Ryan Barnett um, stole the show, got the sponsors man of the match, uh, got all the headlines. Uh, he had me looking up his assist total and all sorts. And uh, yeah, he's flying rich. Absolutely phenomenal performance. I was laughed at when I got a Ryan Barnett shirt last season, wasn't I? And now, but, look at us all now. But, it's gone up but, in value. It has gone up but, in significant who was value. Laughing at, who was laughing at you? I think it was just... I got, I think it was on the back of Tranmere away that I got, I was like, I love Ryan Barnett. Let's get his name on the back of the shirt. Because um, I wanted a momentum for last season. Um, our friend of the podcast, Jack, he's very good with his shirts. Um, 
not that he wants me to publicize it so uh, we'll have to edit that out but we won't really um <laughs> he helped me source a ryan barnett shirt from last season and then he sort of dropped out the team though didn't he and obviously luke bolton was signed and lots of us maybe thought that the end was nigh for ryan barnett he's just a, f- a non-league player who's been given a chance in the football league looked all right and it didn't really crack on and i think maybe the first half of last season he still looked like a national league player now he looks not like a football league player, but a league one player and a very good one at that. He looks just, he's playing with such confidence. And he's doing so much stuff that you wouldn't necessarily expect from him. I mean, before he signed, there was all the talk about his crossing into the box, wasn't there? And how did he have the best crossing accuracy, I think, in, in National League in that season that we signed him from Solihull? He is so, so good at putting crosses into the box. Like David Beckham-esque. We, I said bend it like Barney at the weekend. He he just puts the ball in those areas that, like you said, he'll he'll mix up by putting it to the back post and someone can knock it back and get a goal that way. He can put the near post crosses in. He can put them deep. He can put them behind a player, in front of a player. He is such a weapon. And then he's also got pace and he can also beat a man. My favourite moment wasn't any of the assists. It was that run, the Maisie run, when he set up Stephen Fletcher and should have given Wrexham another goal, but he took a touch and took his time and wasted it, Stephen Fletcher, in a rare sort of lapse of concentration. But it was Barney's run in the build-up to that. It was absolutely electric. And when he's playing like that, there is not a defender in League One who can contain him. And that's what I was going to say. He took the words out of my mouth. Is that I think he said himself as well, Barney, that... One on one, he just backs himself against any defender, you know. And I know that there are games on the road where people might look and go, "Well, you know, what's he done? He can't replicate it." But I actually, thought he was our best attacking outlet against Leighton Orient. I thought he was our best attacking outlet against Stevenage. I think he has been the standout. I mean, you could toss it with George Dobson as well. There's been some other really good performers. Marriott's been good, but I think Barney. Almost every game, he's given you at least a seven out of ten. This was more than nine, nine point five sort of area you have to reserve t- I, I don't I never give out tens in, in any player ratings but I mean you know as, was as it Le, good as you Le can Quip, get the French paper have only Le ever Keep, given out like Keep, seven yeah. have they given out like six or seven ten out of tens ever in the history of of football I think <laughs> literally I think I think I think there's been a there's been a flurry in the last sort of few years but it was for a while it was like yeah six or seven and they've given out a few more since but they are notoriously some of the trickiest uh, toughest player it was ratings after, out there. I, just to interrupt, it's 15 people who have ever been awarded by Lequeep. And the last was Adamola Luckman in the, uh, was it the Conference League wow. final or the Europa League final last season? Was it Europa League, I think, where he scored the hat trick against League, Leverkusen? Maybe. Yeah. That was um, it. That was it. Yeah. It ended Leverkusen's uh, unbeaten run. Anyway, uh, I digress to say that. I, I think, yeah, Barney himself said he just feels so confident that. And also, one of the things I took away, because again, I was at the a Yale paddock sort of temporary stand end. I was sort of towards that side of uh, by the corner. And so I had a great view of the first set of goals. And, you know, but Barney's crossing with a real purpose. They're not whipping it in for whipping it in sake. You know, he's very much, okay, they're not all going in, no, no doubt, but he's very much whipping it in with purpose. You can tell that he's practiced it. And his delivery is so good is the whippage of his crosses is, uh, is superb. And, and you know, and this isn't a knock because I think Barney is good and he has improved defensively. But what we're seeing is we're seeing the best of him in attacking areas because he was a winger for Solly Moors. He wasn't a wing back or a right back. He's he's a winger that we've converted into a more defensive player. You know, he was a an orthodox winger. Um, so you know, he 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 was this winger that his 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 currency was attacking output so i'm not surprised by it i and, and and i said it at the weekend i tweeted it. i think he's championship pedigree there's 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 teams in the bottom of the championship i'm led to believe that blackburn were among the among the teams scouting him at the weekend at northampton i mean teams will regularly have scouts um at games as you know rich you, whether you watch the under 21s or 18s or, or first team but yeah i led to believe blackburn had uh eyeballs watching ryan barnett at the weekend and again that is maybe, in a crude sense, the incentive now, isn't it? It's that he wants to be playing in the Championship, whether it's with us or, or with not. Obviously, the preference is to be a Wrexham player in the Championship, but what a shop window this is now. You're probably playing for the most watched League One team still. Sorry, Birmingham City. And yeah, I think 
like you said, I think Dobson for me is still player of the season, but Barnett's the biggest surprise because we all knew Dobson had this pedigree and had this reputation. But Ryan Barnett, I wasn't even expecting to start games every week this season. I really wasn't. And we had the debate at going to Bolton, didn't we, that we maybe would have, we'd like to see Barnett and Revan, but it would probably be Revan and McLean or, or something like that. And then right now, it's, it has to be Barney. He's 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 a clear starter. He's he's ousted any competition from Luke Bolton. It's not even a debate anymore. And we'll get on to Anthony Ford. What we saw from him against Wolves because that was quite uh, quite interesting. But yeah, the Northampton game was excellent. James McLean as well. I mean, his quality oh. really shone through for me. I'm... Well, well, Rich, I, I was going to say, but we, a year ago, I don't know how long ago it was now, when we were doing our kind of. What can we? I think we did a hot take amnesty ahead of League Two, and we said, "I know where this is going." And we said, "Did we say Ryan Barnett would be in team of the season, or would be in the conversation for League Two Player of the Season?" Now we said, "Yeah, our hot take, our controversial opinion was Ryan Barnett for League Two Play uh, Team of the Season." I mean, so, League One. Team so of the season? you know, so maybe we were a little bit premature on that, but we we could see the vision. I think. I mean, my vision's not great, but even I could see the vision uh, for Ryan Barnett and. It's, it's, you know, I think Sutty might have said it recently. Sometimes players just find a level that... I remember I remember that Coventry game and, and seeing how many of our players elevated in that game. And I know it's a one-off game and sometimes you can get those. But when they had the time on the ball, I saw Tom O'Connor, I saw Elliot Lee just picking apart players that were d- divisions above them. And um, with Barney, the the kind of the pace and power and speed of, of League One, I, I think it's just suiting him down to the ground and... You know, at home, he's brimming with confidence. They believe in him. He is clearly the better option as an attacker than James McLean. You know, it's definitely, we're a little bit lopsided in that sense. And I think if teams, not to, I mean, I'm not I'm not giving any secrets away here, am I? I mean, any analyst worth their salt would say that the way to shut down Wrexham, I think, is to to stop Ryan Barnett. And and if you can stop Ryan Barnett, which is an easier, said, easier task said than done, easier said than done even, um, you love a you love a good go go at, at nullifying Wrexham's attacking threat because you know we are a little bit lopsided and reliant on him, but so far no one seemed to have found the answer, particularly at home. And yeah, I think that is part of the the reason why we're not as effective away from home is because we are playing deeper as a team. So he's he, he can't have the same impact when he gets on the ball because he's so much further away from goal. And we see so many times at the race course that we will methodically move the ball in midfield and then. Sort of, it tends to be Cannon or Lee will link up with Barney, and they'll have one or two passes. Sometimes he'll cut it back in, and one of those two will put a cross in. Sometimes they'll just wait for the overlap and, and feed it to him. But they usually work off one another. And when we're playing away from home, we're usually a bit deeper, so you can't have that sort of influence further up the pitch. And it's just fewer occurrences really that that Barney's getting the ball where where it requires. But really impressed with him. I suppose Naif, that does lead us on to the question of best maybe ever individual Rex and performances that, that we've seen. I know you put a tweet out on your personals. Lots of people got back with sort of Rex and examples. Are there any for you? I mean, Juan Agate at Hartlepool springs to mind, doesn't it? That that one did get brought up. I mean, for me, I, I was just basing it off, you know, who have I seen live? And Juan Agate scoring a hat-trick when I was mascot at Stockport in 2005, that, you know, I was starry-eyed and that was my favourite player. So seeing a player score a hat-trick... Amazing. I mean, obviously at Hartlepool, I didn't actually see that one live. There are some other ones. I mean, Wayne Jones, obviously people know from the turf. His one was not Wrexham related, but was just very good. So I'm going to read out anyway. He put one saw Juan Riquelme score from inside his own half in a game uh, between Independiente and Boca Juniors in Argentina. I stood clapping for about five minutes, never seen anything like it before or after. Um, there were loads of uh, different uh, choices. Um, Juan you got to wait Hartley as you said was brought up Mark Cartwright this was from Super Sub Mark Cartwright at Main Road incredible goalkeeping display from him anyone remembers that one um, I remember Flinney was saying that it was just one of the most incredible goalkeeping performances, performances he's ever seen um, and someone brought up another Mark Cartwright also Mark Cartwright in the first round FA Cup tie against Colwyn Bay in 1996 without his saves that afternoon we would have been dumped out and missed out on a memorable run to the quarter final that one was from Paul um, Lee Trundle versus Oxford 5-3 in 2001 has to be in the conversation says Michael Jones um, Stan Collymore's performance against Wrexham over two legs of the League Cup in 1993 was something else uh, Jamie put Paul Merson for Walsall at the race course against Wrexham uh, stands out and Juan Sebastian Veron in Brian Flynn and Kevin Reeves' <laughs> testimonial 2001 was that I think <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I remember so that. That, um, that, was, that was from Jamie. So there's, there's plenty on there. Andy Morell got a few mentions. Seven goals against Mirtha, uh, Mirtha in the FAW yes, Trophy. And think... Kanchelskis for Everton in a friendly against Wrexham, scoring four goals. I think for me, two of them would have to be Don Vos versus Gateshead because he just pulled the strings that day. And that was such a joy. That was just a joyous performance to watch. That's when I really thought this Wrexham team was special under Gary Mills. I know, hard to believe, but it was the fact we were back in that lovely Adidas kit. We had such a... I really liked the team at the time. It was just a fun team. Obviously, maybe in hindsight, it's not as glamorous or as exciting as we as the expectations we've got now, but having been... It, it'd come after that lull, hadn't it? The failure to get promoted in, against Newport, the 98-point season. We'd had like two, three seasons of a lull, and then that team made me believe again. And Don Vos, that half a season, wow. Like He has such a special place in my Wrexham sort of folklore, Don Vos, because... He was the thing is he wasn't even unplayable for six months because he had quite a lot of games where he did he did nothing. I think I calculated <laughs> at the time there was only sort of three goals he scored that directly affected the result, as in one as a point or or secured a victory or whatever. Um, and the other for me as well, COVID, Jordan Davis against Halifax. I felt like Brilliant. that hat trick he scored at the Shea Brilliant. was such a statement performance and. I know, obviously, he's not the same player quite right now. He had the injury, he felt the team last season. But I feel like for about a year and a half, two years maybe, after Halifax away, Jordan Davis's confidence just skyrocketed and he became such an important player for it. So they're my two, those and, and Jordan Davis. Yeah, and, and Mark Butler actually put for Wrexham, uh, those v Gateshead and Trundle v Oxford. Um, there were loads of different answers, and to be honest, they weren't all Wrexham related. Uh, there were plenty. Uh, bail into Milan. Like, bail, bail into Milan. I mean, the, Twice. the one I the one I gave because I was just thinking, you know, I was I was really blown away by Barney at the weekend. Uh, that would be right up there in terms of the Wrexham ones I've seen. It was a near faultless display. You know, you, you couldn't really pin any blame on him at all. He should have had what four, five assists potentially in the end. It was just phenomenal. Um, really, really, really impressive. One of the best games I would imagine of Barney's career. But for me, the best individual performance I've ever seen was in Turin when I was watching covering Juventus, Atletico Madrid. Atletico Madrid had won the first leg of the last 16 tie 2-0 and I watched Cristiano Ronaldo score a hat-trick and rip the heart out single-handedly of Atletico Madrid. And I was just, you know, when you, you are witnessing just one of those all-time great players just perform at their absolute peak and... Uh, yeah, I've never been able to, never saw Messi play uh, live for Barcelona and loads of other players. I mean, you know, Raquel May, as Wayne said, playing for Independiente, Boca Juniors. I mean, you know, bucket list stuff. But for me, yeah, best ever. So I, I, while I was getting all these messages like Barney's produced the best ever performance I've ever seen of any player ever, I I got him in the conversation with Cristiano Ronaldo, but unfortunately not, not number one. Yeah, I'd also say I vividly remember growing up Adrian Chislovich versus Forest Green Rovers. It must have been like 2012, 2011. I swear he chipped the goalkeeper keeper from outside his box. But genuinely now, this isn't being sarcastic. Adrian Chislovich in the FA Trophy final against Grimsby completely changed the game when he came off the pitch. Okay, it's not a complete performance. But do you remember that? Like 45 thought... minutes when Cheesy was on the pitch? It changed everything. <laughs> I thought you were going to just. I thought you were going to be sarcastic and give something about like Jerry McDonough and your commentary. So we can just play that again. <laughs> or, uh, but you know, when you think back, I was thinking like you know there are there have been some unbelievable performances, but there's been such a lull where you just we didn't have these epic great. Before I was trying to think like, oh, did Marcus Kelly do anything? Did Wes York producers? Did Mark Karen? This and is. I mean, and go, we didn't no, we didn't get know, onto this on. last week, but there was that hilarious tweet that's. I, I wish it was sarcastic, but it wasn't. But it was asking for a refund after we lost uh, to yeah, Stevenage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Jesus. I mean, if you didn't support Wrexham before the takeover, <laughs> losing 1-0 away to Stevenage is not an issue. <laughs> Trust me. Losing any game in League One is not really a struggle. There isn't going to be a struggle now. The struggles, hopefully, are well behind us. It will never get that bad again. <laughs> we have been through some very dark times. If you think losing 1-0 to Stevenage is now doom and gloom, please, <laughs> you represent the fan base. Do not do that. Don't do that. That's a convoluted way to look back at Northampton. Wolves, under-21s. 11 changes. Who stood up for you on, on Tuesday night? 
for what Lewis Brunt, um, I really, really was impressed by him. The, the, the diagonals he was just spraying around the pitch. I mean, and that ball, that diagonal, he kept being able to play to Seb Revan, who, again, I thought, and I tweeted this as well on, on the Rob Ryan Red account, at Rob Ryan Red, if you, for some reason, don't follow us on there already on X. Um, what I like about Revan is he's such a good ball carrier that he's quick and can carry in stride, which sometimes you see players that are really quick and maybe the ball's too far ahead of them or they can't keep it. Revan's got this great ability, which you'll typically get in, in, in players that come through these Premier League academies. They can just carry it in stride really, really well. Um, so Revan, I was particularly impressed with. But Brunt, for me, I think the top three for me were Brunt, uh, Revan and Ford. You know, Ford doing his best Barney impression, got two assists instead of three. Um, you know, why on earth... Anthony Ford is still unregistered. I don't know. I think he's got something to offer at League One level. I know this was Wolves' 21s, but, you know, good deliveries. His good delivery, delivery, deliveries. Man. Yeah, yeah, good I... deliveries, good deliveries. And uh, George even on, on I was Ford. thinking, why have we not seen him on corners and free kicks more, even when he's sort of in the team? I don't really remember him taking that many set pieces. There was a free kick. Did he score a free kick against rings a bell. someone uh, that rings a bell. but the thing is when he was in the team you'd have probably had like Luke Young on there Elliot Lee always has preference on corners for I don't know why yeah. but he always seems to get preference um, Luke Young obviously took them a lot but there, there were a lot of positives Rich and I actually learn a lot more about Wrexham with this heavily rotated team with this ele- with these 11 changes um, than you do in the week to week because the, the first team now is very very similar Woking it was a really big game against Woking that we won 2-1. Was that after the Sheffield United replay? Or after the Sheffield United first leg, maybe? It was like maybe. a mammoth win, wasn't it, Woking at home? Because they were right then like third or fourth best team in the league, maybe? Well, I remember we drew was it the draw? against Woking. Was it two, they, they... The two-all, was it? James Jones I scored, I think. Oh, well, we've got good memories. That's, we're, we're nice young and with uh, very vibrant minds. Rich is going to look that up while I talk about Ford. I mean, we left two spots free of that squad, Rich, one of which was there for um, Ford. The, and the club said if he can prove his fitness. I mean, he's, he's clearly not injured. Uh, he's played both of these Bristol Street Motors games. Not really sure what else he can do, given he's unregistered and not able to play in the league. I would register him. I think, that, you know, they're... Okay, yes, he's behind Barney. He's not going to play ahead of Barney, but when the wing backs have been asked to play every couple of days, even Barney said himself he's knackered. And I think Ford uh, is Ford ahead of Luke Bolton right now. Uh, for me, would be. Yeah, for me is uh, the reason for that as well is because I think Luke Bolton we've just not seen enough of yet. He just look like the fact that he's like an inverted pacey winger makes him useful in some situations, but not in too many. Whereas I think Ford is a more... He fits into the team better without disjointing it or lopsiding it, like you said earlier. Because if you've got Luke Bolton, who is really fast, but he's always looking to cut inside, it means you need someone overlapping him. But because we play the way we do, you don't have that. So you're leaving a huge part of the pitch with no one occupying it, really. And yeah, I just think Ford fits our system better than Luke Bolton does um, personally. So I, I I would love to see him registered. I think he has still got something to offer. Um, is it still two slots we've got available, isn't it? Because Josh Adams signed but didn't take up one. It was, yeah. again, just a shame we didn't see him on Tuesday. Yeah, uh, I, saw, I saw somebody put a picture up of uh, saying the new Josh Adam and, or the, the Josh Adam is the new and then it was a picture of Phil Parkinson shaking the hand of Sean Brisley, which... I, I, I thought you were going to say Charlie Ash. Trafford. That someone else did also put that one, Charlie Trafford. I think he's been he's been nursing, well, I'd say nursing injury. He's played in some reserve games, but clearly he's not fully fit. Um, wasn't even on the bench. Um, you know, is on a deal until the end of this season with the option of a further twelve months. He's going to need to play games to to have any chance of having that extended. You would think. Curious one because that would have been a you know a good opportunity to to play him. Not ready to play, and and even with the eleven changes, really strong team. Rich, you're looking at Rathbone, Farl, Brunt. Boyle, who's had the greatest recovery uh, for his hair than I think I've ever seen. It's 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 even thicker than yours, seemingly now, and you've got a great volume in your hair. So, um, Will Boyle's gone from absolutely not one follicle to um, a full head of hair. It's miraculous. Has he Martin Skirtled it? Do you remember when Martin Skirtle played for Liverpool and it, it transpired that he was he was a skinhead by choice? And then he, right. well, he moved to Fenerbahce, I think, didn't he? And he came back with some Turkish hair. Didn't get the Turkish teeth quite. Um, <laughs> The other thing I was going to say as well, on 
Rathburn. Really enjoyed. There's that link up play in the first half where he back healed it for Mullen and he had a shot at the near post that King saved. I thought Rathburn looked quite enterprising and energetic. Again, I'm just still a bit puzzled where he fits in because right. he reminds me of like a really, but not like a, a central attacking midfielder who controls a game, but someone who just adds energy. And again, I do almost think that in some away games where we might not have much of the ball. Maybe you have Rathbone as the attacker mid and have Lee on the bench. Just because I think Rathbone does sort of harass opponents and cover a lot of ground really well. He he looks like a nuisance, but he's just not as good on the ball from what I've seen so far as, as Lee. But I did really enjoy his link up. Two really nice finishes as well. Mullins was, was great, but I think he sort of had that Michael Owen. Was, uh, was Neville Southall, isn't it? The sort of, well done, he's 14. You know, you're playing against Wolves kids here. You didn't want to celebrate it. You can't be pulling out the dead pool mask for that one. A Welsh pool mask, sorry. And then Moe's goal, you know, it's a very it's a dreadful defending, quite a lucky deflection, but it's a, a good finish. Um, shows he's got some confidence if he's trying that and, and pulling it off as well. So I remember, again, this is a deep dive. I vividly remember, I don't vividly remember because I can't quite remember it's spot on, huh. but there was a game where Deli Adabola tried an overhead kick Oh, really? 2020, 2012, maybe? And I swear it just like cannoned out of the race course ground. So I was pleased I was, to see that, that Moe's actually went in. I was at a wedding once and the Deli on the table, was there? No, but Deli Adebola's best mate was next to me on the table. And so he said, who do you support? I said, I support Wrexham. And uh, he said, oh, have you heard of Deli Adebola? And I thought, well, that's a, not the next part of the conversation that I was expecting. And then... <laughs> You know, he was he was obviously very good friends with Delhi, and you know was saying how great he'd done and how, how amazing he'd done all in his career. And you know, so what did you make of him at Wrexham? And I said it's probably time for the buffet. Uh, hopefully, because, <laughs> um, so that was a. a, a if you have got any Delhi Adabola memories, though, <laughs> Rob Ryan Red at Gmail dot com, we'd love to hear them. Um, but yeah, Wolves, Wolves, go on. Wolves. Um, what else? The takeaway. I, I mean. Look, we're going to get on to 10 talking points from the season very shortly in the next segment. And there's a few uh, bits that I'm going to say for that. But but generally, I thought, you know, I'm not, look, I, I cover Premier League 2 for work, watching Man United's under-21s. I don't like the level. I don't... Um, I don't really rate it as a level, and I would. That's why I would always encourage players to go out on loan and, and really cut your teeth at National League or or League Two or League One if if, if you're good enough, because those Wolves players, I mean, I, I know it's one game. I don't watch them all the time. None of them look like they could make the grade, and I see that so often in Premier League too, where I watch it and go, none of these are going to make the grade. Mm-hmm. Well, there was um again. I know we get a lot of hate for speaking about our day job. We both oh, God, cover yeah. Man United. There's a surprise. We both support Wrexham. Deal with it. But there was a point, uh, I think it was 2019, before he left the club, Nicky Butt, who class 92, trouble winner with United, used to be Man United's head of academy. And since he's left, he's been a lot more outspoken. But there was an interview while he was still at the club. And he basically said, if you're playing for the under-21s, you've got to accept you're never going to make it at Man United. And obviously that doesn't go down well from a club point of view. But that kind of is why the win against Wolves basically counts for nothing in, in that sense, because you're playing against, you're not actually playing against Wolves' best kids because Wolves' best kids are either in the first team, out on loan, or with the under-18s, just the way it sort of works. Um, interesting of note though, Nath, is now ourselves and Port Vale have both qualified for the next round. The game we play with them will determine who finishes top, and if you finish top, you get a home draw in the next round rather than an away draw. Unless, of course, you're against the under twenty ones, in which case I presume it has to be at home anyway. Are you bothered by the Bristol Street Motors? I mean, it was about was it just shy of four thousand there on Tuesday night, which, by modern standards, looks a bit pitiful. But I've been to, we've both been to Wrexham League games where that's the attendance anyway. Quite yeah, a few. I mean, it, must add. The, the the fact is, you know, we made eleven changes. You know, Mo Farr needed to play, Mullen needed to play, Rathbone needed to play. I could go through the entire eleven and add needed to play as the as the, as the ending on that. Um, you know, Callum Burton, that is the seemingly the only way he's going to get minutes. I think he's been very good. He'd be a very good goalkeeper for plenty of teams at, at League One level. Lewis Brunt is knocking on the door now, and this is a good way to keep the squad happy because who knows, it might get to a point where Mullen and Farr are the starting strikers, and, and then you know we're in the last eight of the Bristol Street Motors and you need to give Ollie Palmer a game or, you know, and you, you saw, 
I mean, imagine how demoralising it must have been for Wolves to to see uh, McLean, Dobson, Fletcher, Palmer coming off the bench. And also credit as well to Mullen obviously goes off. He gives the armband to James Jones. Then within minutes, James McLean comes on and obviously James Jones sort of goes over to give him the armband and he says to him, no, you you keep it. You keep it on. And I yeah. thought... I, I don't know. I don't know. I know people sort of wince at the idea of like classy touch and all that, but uh, fair play. I, I you know, I, I no, think that is James genuinely Jones, a nice thing to do. You know, and... J- James Jones is, 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 seems like a very, very nice fella who is is not a bad player, but is just by circumstances fallen down um, the pecking order uh, a little bit. And he was playing with a very, very bandaged hand. It was almost. I don't think it was cast, but it was bright red. The bandage, and he had his. It was like that sort of tape, wasn't and, it? Yeah. Yeah, so his fingers were strapped, but then he also had kind of heavy strapping on on his left hand. So I don't know what's happened there, but you know it was a game that he played well in. I thought. I think. I think. Uh, I'm not gonna had a good shot as well, didn't he? First half. I think my dad yeah. might have voted him. We we disagreed. I voted for Lewis Brunt, man of the match, because you could actually vote for once. It was the fans picking, not the sponsors. So the fans got to vote up until the 85th minute. I voted for Lewis Brunt. I think my dad went for uh, James Jones. So there are plenty of contenders. I mean, Ford would have been. Um, yeah, I think Ford would have been mine from the. And uh, bits uh, I, saw. I only watched a bit of the game because obviously Bake Off was on and we've got priorities in this world. Um, so <laughs> Mofar well, Mo won it lastly on this he, segment before we yeah. get into the test. Well, so, his finish Mofar. was a showstopper, so that's good enough yeah. for me. What, um, was, what, what was Bread Week like then, mate, finally for the Bake Off? Because I bet there are more people listening to this <laughs> that prefer Bake Off than the Bristol Street Motors, I'm sure, almost certainly. <laughs> I mean, this has got. I think. I think Bake Off Watch could bomb more than fantasy football, mate. <laughs> no, maybe, 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 maybe. What, Which what, I forgot what, to what? change my team again because there was a game on Friday night, wasn't there? I've had the same bloody team for about three weeks. So, there's a guy. There's a guy, Andy, sat in front of me uh, at the Northampton game, and he turned around and he was saying, "Just we hadn't spoke to in a while," and he said, "Just thought you know, I'm sixth in the fantasy football league." So, uh, oh, really, that's good. He's doing better than both you and I, mate, and uh, taking it very seriously, keeping an eye on his team. But yeah, let's uh, let's carry on with the show, shall we? Right, Rich. I thought what we could do because there's no game this weekend, and we're not having an opposition preview. Is is ten talking points? We played ten games. Um, you know, maybe we're not where we thought we would be. Maybe doing much better. There's a lot of new signings still integrating. Mullin, um, what we've learned on the road. Max and Barney, there's, you know, the opposition we played, what have we made of those? And I thought we could just, for what's left of the podcast, just work our way through some talking points. Some of them have been sent in by people. Thank you very much for those. Others I've just come up with on the fly. So maybe the good ones are theirs and the bad ones are mine. Um, but firstly, Rich, I thought because the win over Northampton and the win over um, Wolves on Tuesday means that, again, Wrexham imperious at home, flawless, um, no points dropped at home so far this season. Wrexham had the best home form in the National League when we went up as champions. We had the best home form in League Two last year. So home form is the numero uno talking point. But can Wrexham, do you think, have the best home form again in, in League One for a third season? I think we can. I I think it's us or Birmingham, to be honest, because I do see Birmingham dropping points this season and losing games, but I don't necessarily see them doing it at St Andrews because that is... What a tough place to go. We experienced that. And you'd arguably say, well, they've already beaten one of the toughest teams that will come there this season. For us, you know, we've got to play a lot of good teams yet. That's my sort of caveat when I look at the league table early on. Is we've got to play all these teams, both home and away, lots of the top ones still. I think we will be right up there. I think we'll definitely have top, top three home form this season. I just think that the quality has gone up a notch. I still think we're going to swat away so many teams like we did against Northampton. I just think that even like when Birmingham to the race course, I won't be surprised if they beat us. So they've already, they would obviously, if that happens, have beaten us at, at their place. I know James McLean says he wants to get revenge when they come to, to the race course, which is good to see. But, you know, it wouldn't be a disaster if they came there and won. So I, I just think it might be a bit of a stretch because we're against such an anomaly this season in Birmingham who are just, they are going to be out of this league very soon because they are just on another level to anyone else. Well, well, I mean, Troy Deeney told a um, friend of the pod, uh, Natasha, who's a Charlton fan, probably have her on soon to talk about Charlton, but um, said that Birmingham will be uh, done and dusted, promoted by December, um, which I don't... I, I mean, how that'd be matter. Don't you think that's well, possible? Know. Well, given... I, I'm sure Tash liked it because Charlton obviously beat Birmingham uh, at the weekends. I'm sure she was uh, very smug Did about it. Did you see yeah. the outcry from all that, by the way? Was it... 
Billick, the Birmingham defender before the game, had said something along the lines that the league was too easy, I think, for Birmingham. So they're, they're, and then, yeah, something like that, yeah. And then Nathan Jones, the Charlton manager, said, I wouldn't go boasting about winning a beauty contest before it's happened or something. And yeah, then obviously yeah. Charlton won. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we were so, all, we were all Charlton was, fans, weren't we? What I was going to say was, um, you know, and, 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 it, and I'm just thinking, should I say it or not? It's slightly controversial, but I... Well, I found the atmosphere in the Northampton game to be very peculiar. Um, it was maybe it was just where I was, but it, it was it was very quiet. And and I don't know, maybe this just we've been so good at home that there's just an expectation now and and, and almost yeah. an entitlement that we are going to win. It felt like you know, like I said, I know Northampton are an average team, but it it was very much a case around me at least of you know playing this amazing football, but it was almost too easy and everyone thought well we're definitely going to beat these so don't really need to get right up for it whereas I do wonder if that, like Barnsley under the lights be really, you know, say a tough game when Mansfield come on November that, uh, the 6th or whatever that is Huddersfield as well that's a Tuesday isn't it Huddersfield Tuesday night we're going to have and Birmingham and Lincoln's going to be a Tuesday you know, now isn't it yeah Birmingham's going to get moved so, that, so there are games which will probably have to be the 12th man and, and, and maybe we're just mm. so good at home that we don't need to but the atmosphere is a funny one in games like that Northampton one where that just feels such so little jeopardy. I don't know. Yeah, well, I'd say this in general since the takeover that for a home game to be really extraordinary atmosphere, it's either got to be against the best opposition, so Notts County, Stockport, Sheffield, Sheffield United, United. Yeah. the Chesterfield game that was a Tuesday night. It's either got to be on Tuesday night. And of course, that first season was when we played Boreham Wood, Halifax and Grimsby all at home on Tuesday nights and they were free of the better teams in, in that division and they were real big games and proper great nights under the lights. Last season, oh, sorry, the, the promotion season in the National League is sort of like maidenhead and stuff we played on the Tuesday night, so mm. a bit anticlimactic and we had the Oval game, of course. Or it's got to be extraordinary sort of circumstance, the Dover game, which is just absolutely obscene what happens. The Salford game where we come back obscene again, what, what happens to that Eastley as well at home? just because the the chaos that unfurled. But I, I've been thinking about this quite a lot lately because I think there's two points. One point for me is I think just in British football in general, this is a sweeping statement, so there might be exceptions. But teams who are good, the better teams, do tend to have most quite mediocre home atmospheres on a week-by-week -week basis because this isn't throwing shade. I'm going to offend a lot of people who have Premier League clubs here. Worst atmosphere I've ever had inside a stadium for the magnitude of the game, was Liverpool Man United at Anfield last season. It was a nil-nil draw, but it was silent. It was silent. You could hear a pin drop. It was awful for both sets of fans. Old Trafford on a week-by-week -week basis. I know they lose a lot, but it's quite quiet, unless it's a European night or the derby, in which case it's volatile. It's amazing. Etihad, you know, finish the joke yourself, but on European nights is really good, or in the crazy games where City come from behind and do what City do really good atmosphere. I do just think that we, you know, there's such a expectation, I think, maybe for us to win. So it's less eventful when it happens and we do win a lot. So it's maybe lost a little bit of what it means to, to a degree as, as a fan. But also another element for Wrexham is a lot of the fans there are just kind of happy to be there. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're just happy to, to be watching us win every week. So... You know, to be back in the football league is—it's hard to maybe get up for some of the games every single week because we've already—we've been overloaded with emotions over the last two, three seasons that it can get a bit numb at times. Like last season's promotion was amazing, but yeah, it still felt it didn't have the same sort of endorphin hit for me. And I think even now wins—I'm just so used to them. I, I like, which is want... being so entitled, I know, but <laughs> I, you're 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 part of the problem. Uh, I I just wonder. <laughs> I just wonder. If this is where a kind of fan group, or you know, I know there's some suggestion about you know, could they get in, say, safe standing in the cop, or, or could you get? I know because to some people it's cheesy to have like tifos or anything choreographed or whatever, and you don't do it all the time. But for big games, you know, could you? Are there things you could do? Or is there a kind of a, a fan representative? I know we have the fan advisory board, but something a bit more sort of. Um, to the heart of the of the kind of core, maybe it's the tech end lot. I know there's the twelfth man group, but I'm just wondering if for big games, is there something we can do to really, really ramp it up and make it? You know, it's already a daunting place to go for teams. 
I just I just think, you know, is there something that can be done? But maybe you're right, Rich. Maybe just if you win a lot, it dilutes the 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 value, almost but, the shock factor yeah, that you win. I, I'd yeah. also say, though, I don't think it is as bad as sometimes it gets painted because every home game, when I'm in the tech end, at least behind the goal, there is really good atmosphere at some stage in the game. There's a great noise. And I also think there's there's often a, ba- a debate about what was it like pre-takeover. And I do think we can look back at pre-takeover r- with rose-tinted glasses because, yes, there are, are exceptions. And you think back to some of those fantastic National League games we had you know, before the takeover, which were really good. It's sort of four or 5,000 people in the Kairas, or there were some where we'd have seven or 8,000, which was really, really good. But there were some terrible, terrible oh, God, games. Yeah. Just God, whether yeah. it be like three or 4,000 of you just watching us get tonked by Telford or just watching <laughs> just just us go nowhere, just go around <laughs> in circles, particularly in the last few years, maybe before before the takeover. But, you know, we've always had fantastic atmospheres throughout the decades. Whatever era of Rexon you supported back, you'll be able to tell me so many off the top of your head about really iconic games at, at the race course that have been just incredible atmospheres. But I do think that in doing so, you can forget about, because they are so forgettable, so many games pre-takeover where it was just silent and so uninspiring. So, you know, I think it's just football, mate, to be honest. I think that it's it's difficult to get yourself up for Northampton at home. Every, do you know what I mean? And that that's no disrespect to them. That's as much a compliment to us because we've had, you know, such higher highs in recent years. Right, we're going to rattle through because if we if we spend that long on each talking point, uh, we will be here for a long, long time. Uh, <laughs> right, so snappy, we will rattle snappy. through. A few, we will rattle through a few more. Um, I've got it down as the Paul Mullin conundrum. Um, going into the season, well, before we knew he was having minor spinal surgery. Not sure that actually is a thing. I think spinal surgery is always pretty major. Uh, but before we knew he was having that, Rich, the back end of our season, phenomenal. You know, just a run of a player that just, he, he could turn up at any match on any pitch and he was just going to dominate. Um, and the, the fact that he ran uh, Langstaff close for the golden boot, I mean, spoke volumes in the end, given how much of period he'd missed and, and how he was struggling, but maybe before that penalty against Forrest Green. It's not gone to plan for him so far this season. He's obviously took a while to get back, missed the entirety of pre-season. He didn't get to enjoy uh, or sample the delights of Hanley Town, like I did, uh, stood on the grassy bank there. Um, didn't play, so he's been making his way back. He hasn't yet scored in League One. He scored in both Bristol Street Motors games, both goals phenomenal. I mean, the first one against Salford was a long ranger, and the one the other night, I mean, a delightful chip. No celebration at all. I can say it's a Bristol Street Motors game against 21s. Uh, yeah, fine, if you don't want to celebrate. But it was pretty clear as a non-celebration. It was no sort of emotion at all. And lots of people pointing out that he sort of went down the tunnel a little bit frustrated. And I know he's, I'm sure he is very frustrated with how things are going. Um, how, how do you get the best out of Paul Moore? Is it just a waiting game, waiting for it to click at some point? I think it's kind of what he's got right now. It's competition. You know, I mean... It's it's testament to Paul Mullen that he's been a certainty in every Wrexham side basically before this season. You know, since he signed, he's just been, you know, if he's fit, he has to play. It's Paul Mullen and he has to play for as long as he wants to until he almost signals to Parky, right, it's time for me to come off. He makes his own substitution. But I think it's about having some genuine competition because how amazing is it that we're now in a position where Paul Mullen doesn't automatically start? And that is credit to Jack Marriott, who a lot of us, both of us, to be honest as well, Nave weren't expecting this from at all. We Not both all. hoped it would happen, but we just didn't see it getting to a stage, not even this late in the season, where he'd still be deserving and warranting a start. I thought for one or two weeks it might happen, and then Mullen comes back, takes his place. I think for Paul, you know, same as last season when he came out from injury, maybe just needs a few more games to really get that match sharpness back and just have that same clinical edge in front of goal. But right now, Marriott has to start. But he's in that boat that Marriott was in last season where we were judging him whereby how do you get the minutes, how do you get the chance to have goals when you're only coming on for 15, 20 and the actual starter, which was Mullin, you you know, you don't want to change that person really. So Marriott, you know, scores and, and you're going to keep picking him. It means Mullin's I got think... 15, 20 minutes to impress and then it's it's very difficult to get into that rhythm and suddenly we get into late October, early November, Mullin still doesn't have his goal and just feel like he needs that one to to get the train moving down the tracks. Yeah, I, I would just say quickly, though, I think that the quirk of the early seasons, you basically want once a week, there's a couple of two games a week, 
we really will start having fixture congestion in the in the sort of weeks ahead after the international break and sort of months ahead. So I think natural injuries, fitness, suspensions, he will get his chance. Number three, then talking point: new signings starting to find Four, their feet. Uh, uh, we've had home form and the Paul Mullen conundrum, and now new signings starting to find their feet. We just spoke for so long on home. Was form, atmosphere? The, atmosphere wasn't one. Jesus, that wasn't even, that wasn't God, that wasn't even one. That, was, that wasn't even one. But anyway, new new signings. I think they, for a lot of them, they took a while to get in. With Lewis Brunt, really only this week has made an impression. Dan Scar, obviously, in, unfortunate injury to Max has given him a chance. Callum Burton, you were there at Sheffield United. I thought he impressed there. He's looked good in every game he's played so far. Um, Seb Revens had to be very patient, but has looked bright. Bolton away, probably his highlight. Um, there are others in there as well. Mo Far getting his first goal, and you know him in particular. A lot of people talking about his body language looks a bit lethargic. Somebody said to me that he reminds him a bit of Divock Origi almost in terms of that kind of style, where he can look a bit languid, but actually Nonchalant. not. Yeah, but not every player is this, you know, hustle, bustle, run everything down. That doesn't make you a bad player. But anyway, new signings starting to find their feet. What have you made? We did a lot of business in the summer. How do you see where they've all kind of bedded in? Can't quote you've got to count as a new signing. Whether you like it or not, exceptional and goal. He'll be Rexford's team for the next five years. George Dobson, blown away. I expected them to be good. I didn't expect them to be this good. I didn't expect them to be starting every single week. He just, he's hes impeccable. I love him. Dan Scar, the type of defender I used to think we never sort of signed. Just something about him and the whole way he approaches the game. He's the type of defender we'd play against. I think, oh, he's good. I wish we had him. So happy we've got him. I think he'll, I think he'll be starting games by the end of the season. Same with Lewis Brunt. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in quickly on those two. Do you think one of those two or both of those two are in the, let's just say, like so you said, come, come January, are they in Wrexham's best choice? top back three which one do you think makes the cut it's tough isn't it given the injury right now it depends how long max is sort of out for i i really like the look of of brunt i think he's the one who will have the better long-term career at rexham but maybe right now short term it'll be scar just because he's been there and done it he's proper no nonsense i think as well in the in the center of a back three that could be his position sort of long term going forward but obviously you've got with the Connell, who is better playing there as well. So, yeah, for me, I think Scar and then Brunt sort of sharing a role. What about you? Yeah, I've I was, I mean, look, you could have a it's it's different styles because if you let's just Max would be in my first choice back three, as would Tom O'Connor. They would be pretty much locked in for me. So it basically leaves that spot in the middle of the back three. Now, if you put Brunt in there, which is where he played on. Tuesday against Wolves under 21s you would have three elite level ball playing centre backs that could all spray the diagonal that could all play that long ball Max loves that long ball over the top O'Connor's a master at that and Lewis Brunt I even think that's like a championship defence but not a league one defence I, I, I very much uh, I'm inclined to agree with you, Rich, you know, but you could go with that no-nonsense Scar O'Connell type. I know that's slightly unfair on O'Connell because he can sort of step out and, and do a bit more. It's probably, there's three tiers. There's Lewis Brunt who can just play it out and do whatever you want and basically play midfield. Owen O'Connell who's kind of an in-between and then Dan Scar who's just going to head it, kick it, uh, lead by example, has already proven he can... He can uh, get a team out uh, like like he did with Plymouth, you know, very, very experienced and great immense value in that. But I'm really intrigued if we ever see it of O'Connor, um, Brunt and Cluith. I think that'd be, um, yeah, really, really interesting. Yeah. Number four, then. Right, let's move on. Keep it moving. Mo Fowler, though, but yeah, as I say, uh, lots of people very much picking picking holes in his game. He's played two Bristol Street Motors games. Let's give the lad a chance. Um, right, then, where are we now? Uh, Max and Barney, how high can they go, Rich? Because they've been the two probably bright bright spots for Wrexham so far this season. I know we've got Dobson as well, but two young lads. They're very good mates. they formed a great connection down the right. Um, how high do you think each of them can go? It's tough, isn't it? I think Barney, can, uh, Max, sorry, or start on him can go to the very, very top. Um, I genuinely think he could get to the Premier League one day, just because I've said it since National League that he reminds me of John Stones at Barnsley. He's just got all those raw attributes, and I know this sounds ludicrous, but the higher up the leagues we go, it sounds more believable. 
I'm not saying a Pep or someone like that, but one of these, it's like a Brighton or somewhere. If they had someone like Max in central defence, you could imagine him playing in the Premier League and, and getting game time and really sort of going on to become a decent Premier League footballer, which is incredible because this guy was playing National League football what so recently, you know, so in recent last year it was 2023 he was playing national league football you know wouldn't surprise me if he wanted to play in the premier league barney i like you said i think lower end championship certainly could do a job i still think right now though he's a league one footballer i think he's been great but he's still got a lot of work to do to prove this is his actual level because it could just be a purple patch it could just be a good start to the season we've seen that before and the players drop off i think for me right now i'd say barney is a league one player max is a championship player Right, well, that moves on to talking point number five, contract decisions to be made, because Barney is one of those that is out of contract at the end of the season. That has obviously been our pinned tweet on X um, for most of this week since that game against Northampton. Now, he's not alone. He's not the only player out of contract in 2025. Um, there will be a graphic that's out on our social media, which will give you a full list of 2025, 2026 and 2027. So do go and check that out um, after this is out. 2025 then, Rich, I'm just going to rattle off a load of names and you just tell me if you'd keep any of them um, or or if if you stay silent. It'd be like that game that all these influencers seem to play, like uh, speak when you hear a player better than. But let me know if you'd keep any of these out of contract in 2025. Mark Howard, Jacob Mendy, Stephen Fletcher, Anthony Ford, Ollie Palmer, Jack Marriott. Yes. Maybe, depending on the league. I think if we stay in League One, you could give Ollie another year. Give him I think another year. Just on what he's played. I, I know that sounds controversial because we've both said in the past that he could leave, but I think because there's so much attacking overhaul next summer potentially, there might be value in keeping Ollie Palmer for one more year. One more year. Okay, Jack Marriott? Yes. Again, one more year potentially with a with the option of an extension for two, if you can get them on those terms. Ryan Barnett? Yes, certainly. Yes. Um then the rest are Jordan Davis, Sam Dolby, Liam Hall, James Jones, Billy Waters, and Josh Adam. Although Josh Adam does have the option of a 12 month extension, um, should that be triggered? 2026, then, so they'd be going in at the end of this season. So we're saying three at most next summer, so, and that's being so generous, aren't we? So really? you're saying out of Howard, Mendy, Fletcher, Ford, Palmer, Marriott, Barnett, Davis, Dolby, Hall, Jones, Waters, and Adam, you would be keeping Palmer, Marriott, and Barnett. Yeah, and it might actually only be Marriott and Barnett. Do you right. know what I mean? I'm so in a good 2020... mood tonight, so Palmer can have one. You can have one, you can have one. <laughs> 2026, and so this will be going into the final year of deals. There's George Evans, Luke McNicholas, uh, Luke Bolton, Will Boyle, Jake Bickerstaff, Andy Cannon, who again has the option of 12 months to extend him to 2027, James McLean, Owen O'Connell, and Callum Burton and then tied up to 2027. Arthur Oconquo, Max Clewart, Lewis Brunt, Elliot Lee, Paul Mullin, George Dobson, Seb Revan, who's got the option to extend into 2028, Tom O'Connor, Dan Scar, Mo Fowle, and Ollie Rathbone. So the foundations have been laid, Rich, but yes, uh, Ryan Barnett, one of those out of contract. And I don't know, do you think, look, they gave Tom O'Connor an extension, they gave Max Clewart an extension, they gave Andy Cannon an extension. Previously before that, they were very quick to tie up Lee and Mullin. Do you think Barney's form has caught the club off guard? I think so. I think it surprised everyone. I don't think anyone can hand on heart say they expected this from Ryan Barnett this season because it's a level way beyond what he's producing last season, which was at a lower league. So, yeah, I'm staggered by by how good he's been at the start of the season. I'm really, really impressed by him. And even if this is sort of the incentive that, look, your mates will got contracts. Go prove you deserve one. Well, he's doing it right now, isn't it? I I still think the ball is very much in Wrexham's court with it, though. Well, that's what I was going to say. The last thing on this talking point is, when do you give that contract? When do you do it? Do you do it now? It's it's easy to get swept up in the fanfare, but are Wrexham going to go, actually, let's let's let it play out. Let's let's wait and see. Because, look, if it gets to January think, and there's yeah. no deal, Barney's got to be looking at his options when there's likes of Blackburn and others sniffing. I think you you do it for this month or next month because I think worst case, what a backup he is. And we've spoken about Ford and Bolton could both leave eventually. Do you know what I mean? So I think definitely give him a new deal. Again, to talk about the day job, there was a time, I think it was Jose Mourinho's Man United 2019. They used to save contract renewal. They used to save their contract um, announcements 
for the day after they lost heavy heavily. <laughs> so I think when they lost three 0 to Liverpool at home, they like gave Anthony Marshall a contract the next day after. I'm not sure if that's a uh, therapy or making things worse, but who knows? Maybe if we need a lift on a on a cold Monday after a defeat against someone, we just uh, give Barney a new contract and cheer everyone up. It seems cynical, but I very much agree, Rich. Uh, that seems like a classic PR uh, move. Um, right, what else <laughs> have we got on this list then? Um, learnings on the road. Obviously, away form was a big talking point last year. We were there at Accrington, Doncaster, you know, other... Walsall, you were there for that one. I mean, some really, really disappointing games. You are going to lose games. We are going to lose, what, in the region of, what do you think, eight, nine games at least this year? Uh, I would I would guess it probably and, and if we don't lose that many we're doing absolutely fabulous so brilliant what what have you learned about us do you think we've taken a, a step back or do you think we, we were much like we were last season and, and the level's just gone up because I think it's been puzzling for people why we're still so good at home but away we seem to be a little bit insular a little bit playing within ourselves well we weren't this we we didn't start last season this well did we so we've got to be better than we were Last season, I, I still think that it's just kind of the nature of sport that away from home, you're going to have a drop off because likewise, the, the race course is a fortress for us. All other teams count their home games as as a fortress and games that they should be winning as, as a basis as well. I just think it's, it is, it you know, for me, it can't be that sort of binary that you can be really good at home and really different away from home. Like to me, that doesn't quite compute in my head. I still don't quite maybe have the the articulation to to try and find out why. I maybe I can't break it down well enough. Why are we so much worse away from home than home? Because we all know it, but there's got to be more reasons to it. So you know, any former players or any tacticos who want to say that, please try and explain to us. Um, yeah, I just think that. It's still kind of the same as last season, to be honest. And it was the same in the National League. I, I know the second season, uh, when, uh, the takeover when we finally got promoted, it, it was much better for us. But even even in National League days, we were winning every week. Away games were still just not quite the same. I think that is just football. That's just sport. Well, the next one I had was basically it li- 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 links into this one, loops in. Quality of opposition. We've obviously seen 10 teams come up against Wrexham. Who has impressed? What have we made of the teams that we've seen so far? Because obviously we'll have to play them all again, uh, whether that be at the race course or at their ground. Obviously, we, we spoke at length about how good Birmingham were, Tomoki, uh, Iwata and, and Stansfield and all that. And that They were the best team I've seen in a long while. But the other teams, I mean, can what I, have yeah, you, made, can have what you made of? Yeah, go for it. What do you think? What's your take? I actually am quite unimpressed by how of the quality in League One, I I was told it was going to be a really difficult league, and right. the fact Stockport are sixth, Mansfield are third, we're second. I, I actually think that it's quite a weak league, to be honest. I so, think that a key part of that is that some of the teams that were predicted to do really well, like Rotherham and Bolton, have both struggled. So Barnsley in the, in the first few weeks, but yeah, I just think it's quite a quite a weak league. I actually think it's kind of an extension of. Of League Two, to be honest, I think. So, I mean, that I mean, what, we, Richard... we used to talk about how there wasn't much difference between the National League and League Two. I actually don't think there's much difference between League Two and League One. I really don't. I mean, from what I, I've I seen so far, I don't know if we're in like Rich's hot takes here or spicy ones or whatever. But I mean, <laughs> Wrexham have beaten Wickham. Wickham, I mean, fifth. Yeah, but they they looked they looked fine, didn't they? They looked similar to what we'd face top yeah. in the League For, Two. First day of the season, though, I don't think you can read yeah. anything to it. To be Bolton away, I mean, you were a little bit higher on Bolton than I was. Obviously, I couldn't be much lower on them. Um, Reading at home, I mean, again, they've had some good results, but that day they they really stunk the place out. Wrecked some easy winners. Peterborough, you know, we 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 bossed them. I was really unimpressed with them, and I've got them third in my predicted table. If anyone you know remembers that preseason, Shrewsbury were as bad as I think we thought they would be. Rich, you know, we both got them going down. Birmingham probably as good as we thought they would be. <laughs> But then you look at the other two, you know, Crawley, Leighton Orient, Stevenage, Northampton. I mean, yes, we didn't win all those games, but, you know, and we were we were part of it going into the season. League One's going to be a massive step up. It's going to be really difficult. And, and this isn't to be arrogant or anything, but, I, you know, I think what I've learned through the first 10 games is the, the gulf's not huge if you're a really good League Two team, which we were. And and I think we've shown in ten games we can compete with most of these teams. Yeah, absolutely. I think again, 
the the caveat for the free newly promoted teams that we're all used to winning and we've all got that mentality and that momentum that that you can't just get off the ground it takes time to harness it gets so much it takes so much time and you know those are clubs especially with Mansfield because they had so many near misses before last season God, that the, the three of us have all had like three or four seasons of real momentum building behind us. Uh, so I think that's a part of the reason why we're I doing so well I, this season. I, I predicted Mansfield, didn't I? Did, did I predict them to go so down or just about survive? Right, not, well. good. not good. Not um, good. Right, let's rattle through the last three then because these are fun ones. Has, has James McLean surprised you? Because again, obviously you love him. I was a, a doubter that had to hold the hands up and say, look, he's he's been better. I think he's not looked as defensively suspect as maybe he did in league two it's a, it's a weird one I, I felt like he was at times a, a, a weak link defensively in league two he's been brilliant and he's adding goals to his game i mean you know we, we i mean i'd say we i definitely was a bit puzzled by the contract extension that when they did it the how early and and why they felt the need to do it but hey i, I you know his value's been immense so far yeah absolutely i think he's just I love him. We, I think that's well documented. He, he's, he's not surprised me, and he also has surprised me because when you take a step back, it's like, well, of course he's got to be good. It's James McLean. But there was genuine discussion, wasn't there, about going into the season. Do we keep him for another year? Yeah, I love him. To be honest, I know he gets a... Was it before the weekend people were saying he's finished as well? I saw that tweet. Um, After the show. Yeah, what? <laughs> After the it's like the Anthony kick. Amy. Is that the Anthony one, Amy sort of? I, I saw one that said he, he's not finished. He's twenty nine. I, I yeah. saw the one that said he only gets picked because of his views, because his views yeah. are popular. Um, I think he very much uh, sent a message back. Ridiculous. Message back there. Um, all right, yeah. then, number nine. Number nine. Then, Rich, uh, should Wrexham win the Bristol Street Motors Trophy? Now, obviously, it's a competition for League One, League Two. Birmingham are in that and are also free scoring. But with Wrexham making eleven changes, and they'll do that almost every time, it'd be nine, ten changes because they've got a second a second string that could easily play in League One, I think. Should Wrexham go all out to win it? I know you're saying they're not going all out by leaving out Dobson, McLean, or whatever, but Wrexham have got to be, you know, targeting a final run, a Wembley appearance. I think they... The, the, it'll be like the FA Trophy. We'll rest plays until we get to the quarters or the semis, and then we'll see where we're up to if we, if we get that far. You know, statistically, and... If it was done on seedings, we are the second highest seed in the tournament because we're the second. It only goes up to League One and we're second in League One. So, you know, we've got a very good chance of winning it by that logic. I don't think you set out to win it. I don't think any team has ever set out to try and win the, the Bristol Street Motors Trophy, really, is a, an early season ambition. But, you know, all right, let me, we, let me rephrase it. Let me we rephrase can rest it plays and still win it. Let me rephrase it then, not in terms of should uh, Rexham say prioritize winning it or anything, but just with the depth we've got. You know, yeah, it's, it, us it, up, it, it's it's like the FA Trophy, mate. It's us up. Yeah. If, if it could be us, it's like the, us versus Stockport in that semi. It could be us versus Birmingham for a chance at Wembley, and then we can lose to Bromley again. So also, yeah. Also, I was playing my, very quickly before we get into the last one. I was playing my like FIFA career mode, and I was in Papa John's trophies. It's, uh, it was called on that old version of FIFA, and I got to the final, and I had to debate: did I put my starters in, or did I stick with the lads that had got me there? And I, I, I'm as a manager, I'd be sticking did with the lads that got him? me there. No, no, I Would you? The man- we didn't win, and I looked a fool. And my my manager rating was, went down. Was but... it with like cup goalkeepers? Lots of people used to have. <laughs> you know, that was quite popular for a while, wasn't it? It still is yeah. actually. But then when you get to the final, it's like actually, mate, you the good one <laughs> used to play. So uh... right. Lastly, uh, have our League One expectations changed? What is our benchmark for success now? Um, I, I think... think you and I both had us about eighth, ninth. I can't remember exactly, but it was outside the playoffs. Have we changed our minds? What do we think is now the barometer for success for Wrexham? I, I still personally wouldn't be bothered if we finish eighth or ninth for season because I'm still not necessarily very happy are you bothered. One. But I think, think the expectation yeah. has to be playoffs now. I think yeah. if you don't get playoffs, given what we've said, that the League One standard doesn't actually look as high as as it is. Um, the fact that we've got this momentum now, what would missing out on a promotion do? Would that halt the momentum? Would it be difficult to build it back up again? You know, this might be our best ever chance in a weird way of getting out of League One, almost catch everyone off guard. Well, they're not expecting us to be this good. I, I think playoffs have to be the minimum now, just yeah. the way the season started. But personally, I wouldn't be bothered if we miss a lot of them. No. I do think that has to be expectation. 
I, I think that I think the the benchmark has changed now in terms of maybe flirting with the players. I think Wrexham should finish in the playoffs. They've got they've got the quality. They've got the resource that in January, if you need to go and make a splash. Um, and talking of transfers, I mean George Evans out for a while. A former, I mean, should I say that? Should I keep? Should I keep checking it out? I don't know. I've already texted you the name of the player that um, could be coming in. I'm just saying, should I just throw it out there for the sake of it, or it might come to nothing? We'll see. Well, well look, teaser says no. Yeah. Well, we've heard. Well, I think the yeah, the we've point heard, there we, is we've that heard, we've heard we've heard George that. Evans being George Evans being injured. Wrexham are going to look at the free market at the free agents and see if there's anyone else who could um come in and potentially do a, a job. Oh, like right, look, um, I, I'm just going to throw it out there because it was a play- <laughs> Matty James, formerly of Leicester, is a player that Phil Parkinson looked at in the summer before we got George Dobson. So we're looking at him in the summer anyway. Um, uh, Matty James, from my understanding, has had talks with championship clubs as well. You know, he's a free agent, very experienced, um, would would provide that kind of George Evans. He's more of that George Evans type. And I think the view internally was that, you know, uh, George Dobson's a better player uh, and, and younger and, and a player that Phil Parkinson's worked with before and knows well. But free agent, um, if there's any legs to it, we'll soon find out. But Matty James, potential uh, free agent uh, that could come in. Like I said, Rexham have got two spots free in their squad. Does one go to Anthony Ford? I think it should. Does the other go to Matty James? Maybe. We'll, we'll soon find out. But for me, playoffs are the benchmark now um, for Wrexham. As I've said uh, many, many weeks ago, I still think that that second spot is in play for a lot of teams, for Mansfield, everything, for Stockport, for Mansfield, for Barnsley, for Rotherham, for Bolton, or Huddersfield, who've dropped off, you know, dropped like a stone. There are a lot of teams that I think are Wickham right now that will look at that second spot and go, right, Birmingham are going to run away with it. But for Wrexham, I think if you can finish in the playoffs, whether you win it, win the playoffs or not, doesn't matter. Um that that would be a hugely successful season. And for me, yes, at the, at the opening 10 games, the goalposts have moved ever so slightly. And there you go, 10 talking points, 10 games, 10 talking points, an hour-long podcast, um, <laughs> no game at the weekend, happy days. you got all weekend to listen to it. Yeah, exactly. And also on that note, if you've got any questions, next week, we say this a lot about a mailbag episode, but we We're literally terrible. have nothing else to talk about. Um, so next week's podcast, we'll preview the Rotherham game. We'll get a Rotherham podcaster on, hopefully, or a journalist to, to give us their verdict. But we'll have this 30, 40 minute of nonsense. Um, <laughs> if you've got any questions, any thoughts, anything at all, anything we've ever discussed, any new features or anything at all, Email us robryanred at gmail.com or go to robryanred.com and use the contact us button on there. Facebook and tweets and YouTube comments, we love them, but we're less likely to have them all in one place when we do the next record because they're quite hard to keep a track of. So if you want to have anything read out on next week's podcast, send it in through email or through the website. But again, thank you so much for, for all your support on all the platforms. We really do appreciate that thank, um thank Nate, you so yeah. much thank what you, you got well, do- thank you i was gonna say thank you so much for you for you say that to everyone that uh, despite uh they were having a good laugh in the mice gwyn rich about the fact that everyone's trying to get fantasy football cancelled i haven't we haven't got time to share the screen everything today uh <laughs> but i will say gareth collins uh manager of the week very well done uh Oconquo ye faithful um for game week nine so remember change your team there's only I think two League One games and a full card in League Two. So it's mainly League Two teams to pick from this week. Um, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the the haters that are trying to get it taken down. And bit by bit, I mean, we've done less and less since I come back uh, from holiday. So maybe you're getting your wish. But um, yeah, uh, Gareth Collins, I thought I would just say manager of the week. Well done. What are you going to do with your weekend, Nath? I, uh, this is our, is it sad or I, I was tempted potentially to to go. Don't ultra, kill the mood. Ultra, I was going to I was going to go Altrincham or uh, Altrincham against Solihull Moors, but I think I'm just going to take a football free. I'm going to have a football free weekend, just catch up with some friends um, and and enjoy it. Enjoy enjoy a rest weekend. What about you, Rich? What are you getting up to? Reruns a Bake Off or uh, um, climbing a mountain? That's normally what your Instagram contains. One of those two things. <laughs> Weather permitting, I think it'll be Ramsbottom United versus Cheel Town in the oh. Northwest Counties Prem with a can of John Smiths on the side. Rammy top of the league at the moment. Um, yeah, I just love sheep, mate. Um, so the Rams, the sheep shaggers, wherever I go. 
But yeah, I think I'll have to have a football fix somehow this weekend. Obviously, well, Wales on Friday night as well. Try watch that against it's England. FA, FA um, Cup, I think. FA Cup quali- for fa- fa- fourth qualifying, final qualifying round. I can't even speak. Um, so soon it'll be the FA Cup Iceland first round Wales, draw. Aren't they? Not yeah. Finland. Yeah. yeah, Iceland. Yeah, but soon mm. it'll be the, the FA Cup first round draw. And Wrexham will know who they're playing. Could it be? Those uh, across the border, maybe they're playing Scarborough. Are they so, across the so, border? Well, I mean, Flinch, de- last time I checked. De- depends who you ask, I suppose. Uh, but hey, that could be the game in the FA Cup. We'll soon find out. And uh, yeah, next week we'll have all things to talk about. Um, anything you send us? Uh, I know there are some people again pulling me up at the game about things they wanted us to discuss. Uh, one of which uh, we did get a text, Rich. We'll do this next week. Um, the benefits, the pluses for long ball football from our friend Super Cute oh, Jeff okay. in Vancouver. Why does everybody talk negatively about long ball football when it's so effective? So and we, we also had a week. question that we'll answer for next week on if Wrexham joined the Welsh League Cup, would that mean we could never, ever play in the Champions League or could it be rectified at some point? We will have the answer for that one next as well. Week. Thank you, Nath. Thank you to Red 10 People Development for continued sponsoring and love for the podcast. Genuinely couldn't do it without you, Will, and, and all the gang. Thank you as well to Rex and Bass Band, Hypnotic, for the music, the stings that you've seen, you've listened to on today's show. If you've not liked and subscribed already, then please do. Enjoy your weekend off. Let us know what you get up to, and we'll see you again next time. The Rex AFC Podcast with Nathan Salt and Rich Faye.